The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of the letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you shall not kill, whoever kills will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Racha, will be liable to the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fiery Gehenna. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there recall that your brother has anything against you, leave your gift there at the altar, go first and be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Settle with your opponent quickly while on the way to court. Otherwise, your opponent will hand you over to the judge, and the judge will hand you over to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Amen, I say to you, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. You have heard what was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to go with your whole body into Gehenna. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to your ancestors, do not take a false oath. Make good to the Lord all that you vow. I say to you, do not swear at all. Not by heaven, for it's God's throne. Not by earth, for it's his footstool. Nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair, white or black. Let your yes be yes, and your no mean no. Anything more is from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my first visit to this parish and it would have been nice if Jesus gave me a very pleasant gospel on how to be nice to one another, but he gave us hell today. He made it very clear where he stands and where he expects us to stand. The whole scriptures today are focused on three elements. The law, the law of God, wisdom, how to interpret that law, and the absurdity of the cross fulfilled in Jesus. He really fulfills the law. The book of Sirach was composed about 150 years before Jesus, and it's a book written for Hellenistic Jews, Jews who had emigrated out of what was the Holy Land, and they were living in the seat of wisdom. They were living in Greek territory. That's where philosophy was born. That's where the love of wisdom was, was practiced. And, and logic, and, and how to get through life, and, and how to be practical. And that's very Greek for us. Jesus comes and gives us something else. But, but that's very Greek. And, and the scriptures, from the perspective of the author of Sirach, had something that the philosophers of ancient Greek did not have. They have a, a law of God. So the wisdom that they 
propose and the wisdom that they, they were honoring is great. And we should use every stitch of wisdom that we have. But, but the scriptures have something else for us. They have the foundation of wisdom. Even the Holy Spirit is called this, the wisdom of the Father. So we hear things in the book of Sirach, very, very correct things, but they're rooted in the trust that we have in God. If you trust in God, you will live. God has set before you everything that is. If you trust in God and use the gifts that he has given us, we will live. We will live practically. We will live in the eyes of the Lord and we will follow his own, his own ways. Well, that eventually is taken up by the, the people who interpret the, the Old Testament. And Jesus refers back to that. And, and he says, you know, the law is very basic. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But Jesus gives us another insight into the law. And the insight he gives us is God. The insight he gives us is living the law based on God and basing, based on our love of God and our love and appreciation of ourselves. So it's not enough to do what's right and, and avoid what's wrong. It's, it's to go the whole route. And Jesus gives us this section in Matthew. And don't forget, Matthew's Gospel is composed with the Old Testament right here on his, on his side. Matthew's Gospel gives us Jesus as the new lawgiver. Matthew's Gospel gives us Jesus, and Jesus refers to it as, today as the fulfillment of the law. So the basics are true and authentic, but the fulfillment, the living out of the law, is what Jesus gives us, and he gives us those examples today in, in a very beautiful way, in a very practical way. You, you've heard it said, don't do this, don't hate, don't kill, don't... But he wants us to go even further. He wants us to go into the heart of who we are as human beings. Because we can get away with not killing anybody. You know that. None of you probably have killed anybody. But I wonder how many of us have killed someone's reputation. I wonder how many of us have said hate or fool or some other derogatory term to a brother or sister. Oh, but I haven't killed them. I haven't exercised prejudice. I haven't been negative. Except in my attitude. Except in my, my sarcasm. Except in my prejudicial comments. See, Jesus doesn't want a, a, just enough Catholic. Jesus wants us very Christian. And Jesus sometimes come across, comes across as almost too good to be true. Well, guess what? He is too good to be true because He is the Word of God. The Old Testament Word of God was given on Sinai. He is given to us in Bethlehem. The Word of God becomes flesh. So the new, fulfilled law of God is in Jesus and Jesus' examples. And he gets right under our skin with his examples. You, you, you've heard, don't commit adultery. Okay, so I don't screw around with my neighbor. I don't, I don't mess around with him or her. But I go online and I look at porn. Or I allow my children to look at porn. Or I look the other way when, when sex, sexual jokes are being said at my workplace, uh, my, my place of employment, or school. Well, guess what? The heart of it. The whole meaning of it is very clear in Jesus. He's the law. And his law is a law of love. And his law is a law too good to be true. I don't know if it's too good to be true because it reflects God himself, the creator. The creator of all things. Jesus gives us the examples left and right. Taking false oaths. None of us take false, false oaths. Or do we? How many times we take the name of the Lord in vain? How many times we, we, we pass on stories that we get on the internet, we pass it on to someone else because it's something sarcastic or something uh, derogatory. And when we offend one person, it doesn't matter who it is, we're offending the Creator who made all of us. See, it would be very nice to, 
for Jesus to come in today and say, okay, everybody get together, love, and hold hands and sing pretty songs. But no, he says he wants us to get an examination of conscience. He wants us to go in and say, wait a minute, what's the whole heart of the law? And the book of wisdom gives it to us today, and the wisdom gives it to us very clearly, Jesus. Paul says, it's almost an absurdity what we believe, the cross. And it's no accident that we have followed the crucified, resurrected Lord. It's absurd that we follow a crucified Lord. And that should bother us. It should get under our skin because the crucified Lord is the Lord of life and the crucified Lord turns topsy-turvy the law of this world. Turns topsy-turvy the, the morals of this world. And gets us to look at the full heart of it. And gets us to really respect one another as he himself would respect us. Jesus himself. And so we, we worship Jesus Christ crucified, but he's not crucified. He's alive and he's well. And he lives with us. And he gives us his law of love. And sometimes he does come across as being too good to be true. And Paul says it this way, what eye has not seen nor ear heard and what has not entered the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him. He's got a great deal of revelation ahead of us. He's got a great deal of eye-opening experience once we learn the attitude of the law of Jesus Christ, once we learn and continue, and we know the law of love, we know love unto others as he, as he loves us. We, we know that the night before he dies, he gets on his hands and knees and washes the feet of his disciples. We know he forgives those who betray him and those who, who sell him off for a kiss and a few pieces of coins. We know all that. That ultimate law, Jesus, is our role model. It takes our head and our heart. And as human beings, we should use all of the instruments we have. We should use the internet. We should use the Wikipedia. We should use all of the resources we have to learn more about life, learn more about justice, learn more about prejudice, learn more about human rights. That's what the wise Christian is all about. And that's the gift that the wise Christian uses when the gospel is right here and the internet, the encyclopedias, the newspapers, the magazines are right alongside us. Because the law of Jesus gives us a way of living, a way of interpreting life. And what does Jesus give us? He gives us the challenge to understand life, to understand poverty, to understand wealth, to understand prejudice, turn it inside out, and imitate himself. And what does he do? He teaches us to, to, to imitate God is to serve. To imitate God is to love. To imitate God is to forgive. And you know, and just the opposite it is very easy. Because it's not easy to imita imitate the crucified Jesus. It's a lot easier to imitate sin. It's a lot Im easier to imitate prejudice. It's a lot easier to imitate sexual perversion. It's like a snowball. And you know, I'm from New Jersey, so we got lots of that stuff up there. And you put a snowball on a hill. You guys don't have it down here, but some of you probably come from up north. And you could probably do this today in, back in Jersey. But you put a snowball up here on the hill and it accumulates and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time it reaches the, the bottom of the hill, you've got the base for a snowman, right? Big snowball. Now that's what sin is like. This one little prejudicial comment, one little word, one little attitude. It's easy. The first step is easy. And it gets easier and easier and easier as it drags us down. And that's... That's very much like addiction. The first use, experimental, maybe to get a high or to, or to have that first drink, the first cocktail, and then later on, the next one, the next one, the next one. Then you have use, then you have abuse, then you have addiction. 
And it takes us right down the hill. You see why we need to understand the full message of Jesus in the law? Because if we don't understand it, if we just understand the bare minimum, I'm not killing anybody, I'm not committing adultery, I'm not doing this or that, just the bare minimum, we, we, we miss it. Because as we're observing the shallowness of that aspect of the law, although they're authentic laws, the shallowness of it, we sometimes get ourselves deeper and deeper and deeper away from Christ and into sin and into prejudice and into injustice. So the Christian is obligated. Boy, it would be easy to have a nice gospel today about Jesus being wonderful and pious and loving and saying our prayers. That's all well and good, and he does that, of course, in the Scriptures. But he demands of us. He demands that we leave here with an attitude of justice. He demands we leave here with an attitude of Christian living. He demands we leave here with an attitude of confidence in the crucified Christ. Because as we leave here, knowing that we have to turn the world upside down, because that doesn't win people. That doesn't win people to the world, does it? It's a mess, the cross. It looks like he lost. And the world knows how to win you over. The world knows how to attract us. The, ner- the world knows how to advertise and get us to appreciate violence and, and taking advantage of people and greed. The world knows that very well. The world doesn't want to know this, the cru- crucified Christ. Because he's the one who gets us to look at the world and turn it upside down and realize that it's not the cross that's that's an absurdity, but it's the world that's an absurdity. He gets us to realize that the wisdom of God is the foundation of our lives, not the wisdom of Wall Street or Madison Avenue or of the next new dynamic trick that the trade of materialism has to offer. It's very simple, isn't it? To love as He loved to give ourselves completely as He gave Himself to us. So that when we leave here, our attitude must be Christ's attitude. When we leave here, people in the marketplace, on on the shores, in, in your offices, must know that we follow an absurd Christ. That we follow a Christ who understands the will and wisdom of God completely. Not minimally to the cross and to the resurrection and into eternal life.